Can I confess something to y'all? I actually ain't a huge fan of all the extra holidays. Uh, for years, if you have been at KCC, I know I've been here for nearly I'm three months shy, I think, of 22 years, uh, and I complain about Father's Day every single time, but you'll get to hear that next month. I, I'm not a huge fan of all the extra holidays, and I'll tell you why in just a minute. And I know folks will get irritated with that, and I know folks will get upset, but I want you to know, as a preacher, you can never win everybody. There's some who, if I weren't to add a certain song for a certain holiday, Miss Cam's going to hear it, I'm going to hear it, but then there's others that will be like, I'm so glad we didn't sing that. We sing that all the time. I'm so glad for a change of pace. Or even when you come to Father's Day and Mother's Day, there are some who love this day, and there are some who can't stand it for whatever reason. They hold in their heart, and you can't win. You can never find the exact proper balance of everything. So I've never been a huge fan of these. Did you know you have a day to celebrate everybody throughout the year? There's favorite child, there's the oldest child, middle child, youngest child, redheaded stepchild on your mom's side. There is a day for everybody, and if you don't believe it, you can actually Google and find a calendar that tells you every single day there's probably 10 or 15 little holidays or little observances every day of the year. For example, did anyone know that yesterday was eat whatever you want day? And I didn't. <laughs> Daggone, I didn't. I even did a wedding and the family had fish and pig. Who doesn't love some fish and pig? Come on. You know you got to, I'm a firm believer, before Jesus broke bread, he broke chicken. Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> Fried chicken is the gospel bird, church. I'm telling y'all, I know my size don't show it, but I love to eat. And I got done, and the dad of the bride said, oh, we're looking for it. Go on up that way. We're going to take pictures. We'll see you in a minute. I said, brother, I can't. I thought I was going to be able to, but I had to go take stuff to Martinsville this morning What I was going to do my church stuff and get everything straight for this weekend and a bunch of other mess I was going to do Saturday morning. Instead, I drove all the way to Martinsville, dropped off some items for my son, and drove all the way back to get home to change clothes to come back here to help get everything straight for the wedding. He said, wow, well, at least go get a to-go box. No, because if I get a to-go box, well, why is the... Preacher stealing food before the bride. What kind of man is he? Not that I care. I deserve to eat before the bride and groom. I'm just saying I'm the one who had to work. They just had to stand there and go, come on. Anyway, I digress. The main days I love to celebrate are any holiday dealing with my Lord and Savior Jesus. Easter is my favorite one. Any holiday dealing with America. And the most important holiday outside of those National Ice Cream Day. Can I get an amen and hallelujah on that? If you don't know, it's the third Sunday in July. July is National Ice Cream Month. The third Sunday is National Ice Cream Day. It's just a glorious God-given gift. I think that might even be in the book of Second Opinions. I really do. And I promise, I don't mean any disrespect. And Usually if you say I don't mean disrespect, you're being disrespectful. I don't mean any disrespect to all the extra ones, but I personally, as I said earlier, Think a day like today, Mother's Day, I think you should be celebrating the ladies in your life every stinking day, not just one day a year, but every day. Did you know Mother's Day is the busiest day every year in restaurants? So today I'm making some grilled Italian chicken on kabata rolls with some bacon. I've got peach cobbler. I've got blackberry cobbler. We've got twice-baked potatoes. Homemade vanilla ice cream from Bluebell. Not, I didn't make the homemade ice cream. It's called homemade vanilla ice cream. It's Bluebell, so you know it's good from the Lord. Uh, and we're just going to have a good time as a family with my mom, my wife, and my brother's family and all that good stuff. All this good stuff. I, oh, it's just today is the busiest day in restaurants. And Father's Day, Father's Day is wonderful. We're given the opportunity and the privilege to cook our own food on the grill for everyone. <laughs> Did you know more phone calls are made on Mother's Day than any other day in the year? Did you also know that Father's Day back in the day used to hold the record for the most collect calls in the year were made on Father's Day? Nothing says, Dad, I love you, like pay my bills. Did you know that 23 million flowers were sold for the day? In fact, a quarter of the entire year's worth of flowers are sold on Mother's Day. Approximately 65% of greeting cards in the year are sold within five days of Mother's Day. Mother's Day is the third most popular holiday in the world behind Christmas and Easter. And I saw the most important stat I need y'all to know about today. Historically, 
Mother's Day is the day of the least arrest and least amount of crimes, which lets us know that moms are the bad people, the ones doing all this bad stuff. (laughs) As a preacher, I want to proclaim the word of God no matter what day it is, whether it's today or any other day, and I want to do it today by looking at a chapter in the Bible that no one other than my weird warped mind would say, that's a perfect Mother's Day sermon. We're going to be in Judges chapter 4. You can grab your Bible. It'll be on the screen. But you can grab your Bible if you want to look at it personally. Turn to it in your phones and your tablets. Judges chapter 4. Judges is one of my favorite Old Testament books. I love it. There's a lot of great lessons. My favorite Bible story is about a left-handed king who stabbed a fat man. The belly covers up the sword. I mean, this man is huge. Awesome story. Ehud Eglon, you need to check it out. I love it. That's I think in chapter 5 or 6. Anyway, Judges 4 is where we're at today. You see two amazing godly women who set the example on what a real woman looks like. Y'all ready for this? Ladies, gentlemen, y'all ready? Here we go. I started last week's KCC devotion uh, that you get on the other side of your sermon insert. Every week we do that. It leads you into the following Sunday's sermon. Next week we're doing Graduate Sunday. So I've got you praying for our seven graduates on there for this week. And if someone's missing, please let me know so that we can make sure that we get them added before next Sunday. Uh, The the very first day, last Monday, I had you, I started the devotion off with the most popular song in the 70s, or at least statistically popular song in the 70s, I Am Woman, where I personally feel the best woman's song is This Girl Is On Fire. Can I get an amen on that one? That's just, Alicia Keys got me wanting to shout that in the streets. I'm telling you right now, but I digress. Judges 4 is where we are today uh, to challenge our ladies to be strong, to be invincible, to be woman after God's own heart and to lead well through his way. Now, Judges is the most bizarre period in Israel's history, God's followers' history. Every person was doing what they thought was right and that they didn't care what God said. They were doing what they thought was good. It was evil. It wasn't right, but they did it anyway. We see that in Judges 3, Judges 4, Judges 10. They all tell us about it. They did what they wanted, what felt right in their own eyes. Judges 17 tells us this. The transition from Joshua's leadership to later on when they finally got a king for Israel was characterized in the Old Testament by lawlessness, apostasy, and disbelief. God had used Israel's enemies to test her faithfulness. Judges 2, 3 tells us this. But Israel failed miserably. God gave Israel a bunch of different judges over a time period who were local or national leaders to relieve Israel and her misery from the oppression of the nation's enemies as individual tribes struggled to keep the land that they were promised. The period of the judges was characterized by internal and external strife, individual and collective sins, disasters, and the need for deliverance, not the type with banjos playing. Six wars, no one caught that reference, really? Deliverance? Come on, thank you, Pete. (laughs) Six different wars took place during this time period, lasting a few hundred years. Their enemies included the Mesopotamians in in Judges 3, the Moabites in, also in Judges 3, the Canaanites in chapters 4 and 5, the Midianites in chapters 6, 7, and 8, the Ammonites in chapter 10 uh, and chapter 17. But the biggest test uh, was even the time period before the kings, uh, even till the time of the kings, were the Philistines. At times, God delivered their enemies into Israel's hands. But other times, other times, the Lord actually delivered the Israelites, his people, even sold them in Judges 3 into their enemies' hands. Once, seven years to Midian in chapter 6, but not as severe as the 40 years under the Philistine hands, the longest duration of suffering in the land we see in Judges 2 and 13. When we come to Judges 4, where the men aren't leading, God designed it this way, but the men ain't stepping up and being men. You had a bunch of boys being boys, not men. God commanded them to lead, and they weren't doing it. So, some of the ladies took charge and led beautifully under God's care. 22 years ago, the LA Times called a 45-year-old Karen Hughes, some of you may remember her, one of the most powerful unelected women in the United States. 
but she resigned from her post less than a year of being appointed, less than a year and a half after being appointed by George W. Bush. Uh, successfully, uh, when he won the presidential election, her husband and teenage son were homesick, so the family headed back to Texas. This Austin, Texas family just didn't fit in Washington, D.C. Hughes re uh, told reporters, Throughout my career, I have tried to prioritize my family while I have a career. I've prided myself that this is a family-friendly White House, and I think this is a family-friendly decision. Hughes continued her work for uh, President Bush as a confidant, uh, an advisor, a speechwriter, but she no longer served constantly by his side. She would return regularly to Washington to advise the president. She stayed in touch with him constantly by telephone. A few editorials lauded Hughes's family-centric decision, but Washington Insider openly wondered if there weren't other reasons. Ellen Galinsky, uh, president of the Families of Work Institute, insisted that Hughes had not quit working. She said, the fact is, Karen is going to continue working just in a different location for the president. We keep pushing people back into old boxes, work or family, all or nothing. But none of us really fit that anymore. I like that. Kate Kaplotz, uh, Kaplovitz, Kaplovitz, if I can get her last name right, Kate Kaplovitz, a, a prominent author, uh, also rose to her defense saying, every time there is someone this visible who makes such a decision, it's a big stir, mostly because people still don't trust that women can stay in these positions. But trust me, we will hear more from Karen. She's very strong, so don't be surprised when she does something else important. Mary Madeline, uh, an advisor to Vice President Dick Cheney, said, Karen didn't care about the power or access thing uh, that is so big in the Washington culture. The only thing she liked about her job was writing the speeches, the big projects, and advising President Bush. She'll keep doing all that. What she didn't like was all the uh, kabuka, uh, kabuki dancing in the White House, all of which ate away at her time from her family, and that's now over. President Bush himself gave the biggest endorsement, saying, Karen Hughes will be changing her address, but she's still in my inner circle. In Judges chapter 4, church, we see a humble, godly woman just like that. The story of Deborah is not really known. A lot of people ignore a lot of the Old Testament stories, but we see two ladies here who are very good at what they do. The story of Deborah is not a forum or a statement on biblical equality, nor is this proof text for biblical defense of feminism in the Bible. It's not a theological treaty uh, of the role of women in the church or pastoral ministry. It was about a woman who used her testimony, her gifts, and her skills faithfully and selflessly dedicated more than 40 years of her life in consistent service to God, her country, her people, as the song of Deborah ends in Judges chapter 5, verse 31, telling us those things. Unrest, oppression, and suffering were at the peak when Deborah arrived on scene. So, what role does a godly woman play today? How can a woman excel in service to God? What exactly is a woman to do to truly be strong, invincible, and on fire? Because this girl's on fire for God. I got three things. Y'all ready? Number one, she must be firm in service. She must be firm in service. Check out verses four and five with me. Deborah, a prophetess, a wife of uh, Lepida, uh, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. Uh, and the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. Deborah was an incredible woman. But her incredible nature wasn't her, but her allowing God to work through her. Come on. Deborah was a phenomenal person at multitasking. She was a wife, a prophetess, and a judge. She didn't hide her gifts. She didn't hide behind her family, nor did she play hide and seek. She wasn't trying to get her way and cry and pity party when she didn't. Nope. When things weren't right, when hearts were troubled, when enemies were threatened, she stood firm with God. She was not out to prove herself or to have her way or distinguish herself as a woman. She wouldn't have marched for liberation or boycotted or screamed for equality. No, no. She set the true example as all should by living it. 
when the men around her wouldn't lead that God called them to, when the men didn't lead the church but sat around hoping someone else would do it so that they wouldn't have to, when the men weren't giving the spiritual nourishment, when the men waited for someone else to do the work and hoped that they could take the credit for it, Deborah got tired of seeing the injustice and the lack of faith living in her communities. She got tired of waiting for a man to step up and be a man. She knew deep down that she would be the person God meant her to be. There were no ifs, buts, or whys. She multiplied the gifts that she had been given by God, and she served quietly and humbly. The word that's used leading in verse 4 means judged in the Hebrew language. She had to cope with a busy day, a packed schedule, the prying public in ministry, a horde of people, a slew of issues and non-issues that people brought to her. And besides that, she had to manage her home, lead the country, and keep those items separated. The stress women face today is bad. It is strong. But it was nothing new, nothing to crow about, nothing compared to what Deborah had to face, carry, and endure. But God is good. God's grace is always sufficient. He equips, supplies, and assures us when he calls us into service, men and women alike. Deborah was a capable woman. She did amazing work. She had her hands full. People kept asking her, coming to her, pleading for assistance and help in ministry. Their problem became her problem. And I feel that, girl. As She had the greatest honor given to her, more acknowledgement and more pride poured into her than any of the other judges given. People loved her. They respected her teaching, her advice, and her judgments. She had insight, skill, and compassion. She settled disputes, dispensing counsel, and upholding justice. They came to her seeking help for all of their problems in their family, their community, and beyond. The people didn't always like what they had to hear from her, but she didn't mind hurting your feelings by telling you the truth. They always accepted, trusted, and respected what she said, whether she hurt their feelings or not. Deborah had her work cut out for her. She didn't just rule, she judged. She had to put her foot down, make an unpopular decision, disappoint people, but not let them down. She followed her head, not her heart. And ruled for the sake of what was best, not for what she wanted, and definitely not to appease anyone. Next, we see that we also must be faithful in service. We need to be faithful in service. And this we see in verses 6 through 10. Be faithful in service. Verses 6 through 10 says, She sent for Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Go take with you 10,000 men uh, of Nephtali and Zebulun uh, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. And we'll, uh, and we'll lure Sisera, I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. I love her response with a smile on her face. I picture this, y'all. She says, very well, Deborah said. I will go with you, but because of the way you're going about this, the honor will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. (gasps) We need to pause real quick. Actually, let's go ahead and read this last verse. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned uh, Zebulun and Nephtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now, we need to see here, when she says this, this is God speaking through her. And when she says that this won't be given to you, but to a woman, Did you know that uh, women didn't really get a lot of respect for several years? They still don't. I heard a couple giggle, like, we do now. It happens. Uh, Did you know when Scripture says that the women were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, that Jesus told the women that he would return and the women were the witnesses? That was unheard of because people didn't trust a woman. So you would not tell a woman anything. It's like they're going to go around and gossip about it and then change the story around or hold it against you or just sit there stare at you as you're thinking about how hungry you are and she's going to say, I bet he's thinking about another woman. 
I bet he's trying to, I wonder if he still loves me. Do I look fat in this dress? I bet he's not going to tell me if I look fat in this dress. Even if he did, it's going to hurt my feelings because I know I'm gaining weight and I just don't know what's going on. Let's just be honest. Don't ask us questions. So she is being that woman who sits back and says, you know what? I'll do this gladly. But you ain't getting credit for it. God knows a woman did the work. Come on, girl. I'm telling y'all, she stepped up. God's chosen women and God's chosen woman has to do above and beyond the call of duty. There was a salesman once who got stuck on the side of the road. So he stopped and asked direction from this ragged, barefoot man sitting on a dilapidated house. After receiving the information, the salesman was trying his best to start up a conversation. He said, so how's your cotton crop going? man said, I ain't got none. The traveler continued, did you plant any? He said, nope. Afraid of boll weevils. Didn't plant any. Curious visitor then said, well, how's your corn doing? man said, didn't plant none. Afraid there was going to be any rain and it would die out and it would be a waste of my time. Undaunted, the stranger said, well, how are your potatoes doing? Surely you planted some potatoes. He said, nope. Didn't plant none of those either. Scared of the old potato bug. Man puzzled, says, really? Why didn't you plant? Man, the answer was, nothing. I didn't plant a thing. I just played it safe. Barrick was one of those men. He just played it safe. Look, I really don't want to do this. I know I'm trained. I know I'm a leader, but I really, I ain't feeling it, so I ain't going to do it. I know we don't have any men like that anymore, do we? His appeasing reply to Deborah was actually cutting her down. It was letting her down. It was putting her down in an unkind way. Deborah was unique and unlike any other judge. She was the only acknowledged prophet or prophetess in the period of the judges. She had no peer nor equal. She gave the word instead of receiving the word. God didn't speak to Israel through his spirit or angel. He spoke through her. The duty and word of a prophet wasn't taken lightly. According to Deuteronomy chapter 18, if a person claimed to be a prophet of God, and you hear people today claiming to be a prophet, did you know, biblically speaking, if a prophet was ever wrong even once, they were to be stoned to death? You see... You didn't just take that title on lightly because you, your life was on the line. And just so you know, God hadn't spoken directly to Israel as a nation through a prophet in over a hundred years. Deborah not only had many hats to wear, she had many people trying to tell her how to do her job. When the word of prophecy came through Deborah, Barak could either go or not go. But his answer was, I'll go if you go. Uh, I won't go if you don't go. You see, this is actually him saying, ain't no woman going to go out on the battlefield. She's scared to death of all that stuff. She ain't going to do this. Deborah saw right through him. She wasn't touched. She wasn't impressed. She wasn't delighted by his request. In fact, she felt manipulated and trapped and rejected in the worst way. She didn't thank, uh, he didn't thank her. He didn't raise any questions. He turned it down in the nicest way he thought he could. Barak didn't want to do this job. He wanted out. And he was hoping and thinking Deborah would back out too. But his passive-aggressive response didn't work. The issue at hand was personal obedience, not joint action. Obedience cannot be co-opted, co-joined, or co-executed, co-produced, or co-sponsored with another person. Barak's half-hearted obedience was 50% compliance. He was scared to death of the enemy's power, and he wasn't convicted of outright victory, undermining the moral or the morale of the army, and look, making Deborah's company, power, and support a critical factor, not God's. Yet another man not relying on or even going to God to ask for help. Deborah saw right through him. She was tired of the weak, godless men around her, so she leaned stronger than ever on God, knowing God would do good things through her. She did above and beyond the call of duty. So she sent Barak as a leader and man skilled of trained uh, for battles. She wasn't. She wasn't skilled. She wasn't, in, she wasn't skilled in warfield. She had never been on a battlefield. It was insensitive and outrageous for Barak to, in, quiet, uh, in a time like this of crisis, when war is looming, people are uneasy, guidance is needed, Deborah should be flattered, but she wasn't. She had already done her job, 
now she's having to do his job too. So we see a third quality. We now see that when this happens, we need to be fearless in service. Fearless in service. And here is where we meet another amazing woman. Deborah's doing a great job. She is the leader of the whole group. I love that. But then we meet another little, quiet, sweet wife right here. And oh, I'm telling you, this right here, she's about to put the smack down. If you've never heard the story, you're going to remember this name. If you know anyone having a daughter soon, you're going to want to name her J.L. Look at verses 17 through 22. Sisera, the enemy, however, fled on foot to the tent of J.L., the wife of Heber the Kenite. Uh, because they were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the clan of Heber uh, the Kenite, uh, Jael went uh, out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, right, come right in. Don't be afraid. So he enters her tent, and she put a cover over top of him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened up a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is there anyone here, say no. This is where it gets good. But J.L., Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep, exhausted. She drove the peg through the temple into the ground, and he died. Uh, first off, ladies don't get any ideas. We don't need any stories. Y'all remember there was a story back in the 90s of something a wife did to her husband. We don't need anything like that ever again. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it. Ask somebody on your way out, us older generation. We'll tell you. My girl took a tent peg, like a railroad spike, and a hammer, and creeps up on my man as he's sleeping, puts it ever so gently on his temple. Wham! <laughs> Drove it through his temples into the ground. Come on! This girl is on fire! This girl is on fire! Why doesn't Alicia Keys ask me to sing with her? Man, I'd be so good and back up. She just don't know. She don't even know. This is truly a warm and hear her roar, right? God's chosen woman has to do what she has to do. There is nothing more beautiful. Ladies, hear this. There is nothing more beautiful to me than a woman of God who's willing to say, as long as God has given me the opportunity, I shall do my best. Mm. Tell you right now, I found her. She's right there. Don't let her know it. Woo. Jail. Jail was a woman of incredible strength, means, and resolve. Most people don't know much about her. Let me tell you a little bit about her. You see, King Sister was not the highlight of the story, but putting two and two together, taking matters into her own hands, deciding things on her own, were the point. You see, J.L. was a knowledgeable woman of all the current events. She's independent in thought. She's wise in her ways. But J.L. was, however, not always that way. She and her husband used to live in the city. Them city folk tore them up. They moved out to the countryside uh, to avoid further conflict. They were having some family problems. Her husband takes her and moves on out to the country. Smart man. They're in the thick of the woods. We resemble this. We got that. They learned how to survive and thrive on her own. She had to learn how to make adjustments, how to find food, how to defend herself, especially when they were living in an alien land, when her husband wasn't always by her side, and when her family ties were strained. This time, J.L. was caught in a situation similar to many instances in her past. Notice, notice, ladies, she doesn't curse her luck. We don't read of J.L. asking for permission to do anything. We don't see her seeking approval of what she did. She didn't sulk. She didn't throw a fit. She didn't whine and sit back and cry. No, no. She said, I got you, Hoss. Come on in. Lay down. Let me, let me put a cover on you. You want water? Mm -mm. No, no. Let me get you some nice milk. You'll sleep better. While he's sleeping. Aw. Tent peg. Hammer. Threw his head into the ground. I am telling you right now. Why are there no movies about this? You want a true Disney princess? J.L. That'd be the best Disney movie, wouldn't it? Oh, so sweet. You can hear the birds. Dun, 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 dun. 
bam! Jael was a woman who knew what to do, and she did it. With what she had in her hands, with the sources she had around her, she dealt with what was given her. She, she used her brains and her mouth before she used her hands. She wouldn't harbor a fugitive, turn him away, or consult her husband. This wasn't an educational or an emotional decision, I mean. This is not an emotional decision. This is not an impulsive decision. Not even a controversial decision. For the first time in a new land, things were so desperate for the Israelites, they had been crying out to God. The only other time Israel had cried out to the Lord was when they were suffering in Egypt that we read about in Exodus chapter 14, in Numbers 20, and Deuteronomy 26. The nation was in sharp decline, in a sorry state, a big mess. The new generation was facing what the past generation had experienced. Didn't we just do a series on elevating the legacy? The Israelites weren't. They knew what had been done in the past, but they said, eh, we're comfortable. We'll just leave it like it is. <laughs> Horrible mistake at any time. We saw that last month in our series. Things had reached a critical point and at a new low. The situation was unbearable because of the might, the cruelty, the onslaught of the Canaanites, for 20 long years and counting. Judges 4 shows us how we need more godly women when men won't do their job. We need women of God who will lead their family faithfully, fearlessly for their home, their church, their workplace, their communities. We need godly women who will begin Bible studies, who will train the next generations yet to come. We need women of God who will follow God's guidelines and God's words, using their skills, skills, their gifts, and their life to serve, to honor God humbly, quietly, in his favor. Diamonds ain't a girl's best friend, really. Beauty is only skin deep. And behind every successful man is a virtuous, encouraging resourceful woman. I was told a long time ago, right after Holly and I got married, an old preacher and an old preacher's wife standing there came up to me and said, you know, young buck, we want you to know a preacher's wife will make him or break him in ministry. I agree. Would you like to know my response? Ain't that true in any job? <laughs> a wife will make you or break you. Mine has made me several times over. My mom is a saint. She's had to put up with Dennis Eugene Bailey for almost 60 years of marriage. My mom deserves a special seat in heaven. I'm going to tell you all that right now. We need more godly women who live according to his will, his way. Don't strive for recognition. Don't worry about being successful, power. Don't worry about any of that stuff. Get out of your own way. Don't worry about trying to have your own way in home, in church, in the community, or anywhere else. Cultivate knowledge, wisdom, and skill. Ladies, ask God to empower you. Then grab that spike and get to work. Hit away. Not on him. Please, not on him. I don't want this sermon to come back. Well, my preacher said I should do this. No. I need you to set the example for all around you to see and hear God as you shout out louder than ever, Great are you, Lord. Let's pray. God, help us. Father, thank you for awesome stories like this of a woman who is kind, who is loving, who was a leader. When the men in her life wouldn't, Deborah stepped up and did. God, we also thank you in the same chapter you give us a second woman who says the example of taking out an enemy when none of the men had the gall or the nerve to do it. She did it quietly and with ease with the tools you provided. Father, thank you. You provide us all we need to be successful. I cannot thank you enough for the women in my life who have led, who have loved, whether the men around them would or not. God, I pray that you empower them to be what you desire, to step up, to be a force to be reckoned with under your care, not so that they get anything out of it, except loving and serving you. God, I thank you for these women. Thank you. We're putting a song of praise on our hearts and in our lives because truly, as we're getting ready to sing, great are you, Lord. In the perfect name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Won't y'all stand as we sing and prepare our hearts to celebrate in communion?